Report. Applegate TAC 9942069. Awakened. Reporting Officer Supervisor Kasdan. Classified Level Alpha. Anyone opening this report below that clearance has been automatically marked by our tracking algorithms, and hunter-killer teams are en route to your position. For the rest of you, we are going to be going into our most dangerous enemies today, covering some groups that you may already be familiar with. Make no mistake, this information is ranked among the most vital. The Deviants that we are going to go over today have more power in their little finger than all the blood drinkers or shifters on Earth. They can bend reality itself to their whim and make the utterly impossible happen. That's right, my friends. We are going to cover the so-called mages of the Horizon and New Horizon Council. First, what is a mage? I can hear many of you rolling your eyes, but pay attention. These basics are extremely important, especially when it comes to saving your life. Mages call themselves the Awakened, and they are, simply put, just like you or I. They have had their epiphany, their grand realization that reality is malleable and can be bent under our whim. They call this moment of realization the Awakening, so creative I know, and they claim that a section of one's spirit grows or comes alive in that moment, a piece of oneself that is plugged directly into the nature of the universe. They call this piece of the soul the Avatar, and apparently this piece of the soul is what allows an awakened mage to seek greater knowledge and power within themselves. I think you're starting to see that there are some vast differences between us and them. Despite the similar nature of our epiphany, where we hold to science and reason, they hold to faith and superstition. While we call our enlightened selves geniuses, they call them avatars and treat them as spiritual beings. Mages are much different than technocrats, despite our shared ability to shape reality, because they look to gods, spirits, esoteric ritual, and supernatural explanations in order to define themselves and the world around them. We long ago rejected these premies in favor of science, but some few still cling stubbornly to the old ways. I will be referring to the genius as the avatar for the rest of this report, simply to prepare you to think like our enemy. But please remember that this comparison is simply in order to help you contextualize. An awakened does not necessarily start off with godlike power. They divide the fundamental aspects of reality into spheres, much the same as we do. And a newly awakened individual will have almost no knowledge or experience within any of these areas of knowledge. They will simply be aware, with a capital A, absolutely certain in their conviction that reality can be bent around them, and able to see the truth in all things. A newly awakened individual has the capability to view all wavelengths of light, sense the presence of interdimensional entities, though they often call them spirits, sense the composition of material, and more. They have a sense of awareness that goes beyond normal human beings. It is worth noting that the energetic aura of these awakened is very easy to detect. They blaze like shining stars on our scopes in a way that is similar to our highest ranked professors. This means that we can oftentimes catch these deviants before they manage to explore their newfound abilities or refine their newfound knowledge. And we should be very grateful that we do. With that said, however, some few of the awakened do slip through our fingers, and it is these individuals that you must truly worry about. An awakened who escapes our net and makes it out into the world is extremely likely to pursue knowledge about their condition, as well as to take action to expand their powers. I cannot stress enough to you how dangerous this is. An awakened who has practiced within the spheres even a little can easily gain the ability to pull electricity out of the walls, manipulate gravity, teleport, 
speak to and command interdimensional entities, transmute matter like wood into things like iron or gas, and far, far more. There is literally no real limit to what an awakened can do. I say that again because I mean it. There is no limit to what an awakened can do. The strongest of them are true existential threats to our entire organization. We have been fighting against these awakened since we first called ourselves the Order of Reason, and it should say something that they have managed to hold out against us for so long. The mutable nature of reality has long been known to us, but there is a baseline from which all else flows. Indeed, our entire organization was founded on this belief, this idea that reality has a baseline, and that baseline is defined by a science and all its wondrous applications. Things like vampires, shifters, awakened, they are deviations from the standard baseline. This baseline of reality that we must all adhere to is known as the consensus with capital letters. It is best described as the way things are. For example, elephants do not simply spontaneously spring into being out of thin air. This is something which, if it did occur, would be an extreme deviation from the norm that any person would immediately recognize as such. Thankfully, altering the consensus is not something which can be done on a whim. Indeed, we are certain of the existence of a true baseline reality because the consensus seems to fight back. Anything which violates consensus causes a metaphysical, highly controversial phenomena, which we call paradox. Paradox is what happens when the consensus pushes back. It is the status quo that all awakened and all enlightened must fight against. If an awakened causes an elephant to spontaneously generate out of thin air, then paradox will be the inevitable result. Paradox as a phenomena is completely unpredictable, which is why it's so controversial. We do not truly understand how it works or where it comes from outside a reaction to violations of consensus. Paradox can be devastating to an awakened. It can cause their reality warping to backfire onto themselves, turning their bones into wood or even erasing them from reality entirely in an event known as zero summing. As I said, even we have to deal with the effects of paradox at the bleeding edges of our research. Our most talented professors take steps to protect themselves from its effects. The last thing that I will mention about paradox for now is that its effects are amplified exponentially when paradox inducing reality warping is witnessed by the masses. The consensus truly does not like being violated and the more people that realize consensus has been shattered, the harder the backlash will be. A video of an awakened summoning a fireball that makes it onto YouTube, for example, will cause an extreme paradox backlash. There is almost no way around it. Every single person who views that video will generate paradox, which in turn can have drastic repercussions on the world. For example, do you recall in your history textbooks when Tsar Vargo launched an attack on the world itself with a fleet of airships declaring himself ruler of the entire planet in the skies above Paris? There's a reason that you don't know that name or remember that incident. For all intents and purposes, it never happened. Vargo, his forces, even the memory of this event were zero-summed, completely erased from reality. Only a few of us still remember his name at all. Now. I've covered the basic capabilities and limitations of the Awakened. I wish to be more specific, but the truth is that they can do so much, wield so much power that I simply can't be. The only way to truly define the Awakened is to look at their beliefs. Belief is the fuel for epiphany, after all, even for us. 
our belief in the rightness of high science drives us deep into the depths of reason and logic. It is the same for the awakened. Their sureness about the universe is what shapes their power. Their rituals, their so-called spells, how they interact with reality and the consensus, all of this is tied to their view as human beings. Some of the awakened align closely with our own point of view, while others call on spirits or believe that they serve some cosmic order. Indeed, the awakened have grouped together under the auspices of organizations known as the Traditions, and these traditions are what make up the Horizon and New Horizon Council, our long-time foes. We will now cover each of the traditions in brief, so that I can be sure that each of you has a working field knowledge capable of handling these enemies, should you ever encounter them. First, let's chat about what exactly Horizon and New Horizon are. Horizon was the name of the strongest fortress and the largest center of scholarship maintained by a group that was known as the Council of Nine Mystic Traditions. This council existed for millennia in one form or another and stood as our primary rival until we finally managed to invade Horizon and destroy them in 1999 on the heels of the Avatar Storm. However, our purge was incomplete and some survivors were able to flee. These survivors remained disparate and separated for a few years but they soon came back together and refounded the council, dubbing themselves the New Horizon Council of Mystic Traditions. This New Horizon Council functions much the same as the old council, though they are composed almost entirely of younger awakened who bring more modern sensibilities to the organization. They've proven to be a true thorn in our side, but we cannot turn our full efforts against them until we have secured our flanks and rear against the Blood Deviants and the Therianthropes. Both the Old Council and the New Horizon Council have fluctuated in terms of member traditions over the year, but despite this, there are nine which have almost always sat the Council in some form or another. These nine are the Akashiana, the Celestial Chorus, the Sahajia, the Kavadi, the Chakravanti, the Order of Hermes, the Society of Ether, the Verbena, and the Virtual Adepts. We are going to start with the Akashiana. The Akashiana's history, according to them, goes all the way back to the beginning of creation. They claim that in the beginning there was Mount Meru and that humanity clustered around it. Interrogated subjects have claimed that three Jamards, the dragon, the tiger, and the phoenix, came to them and taught them civilization. They also taught humanity the Do, also known as the Way, the first martial art. Interrogated subjects have claimed all other martial arts flow from the Do. The Akashiana believe in harmony, in balance of all things. They train their bodies so that they can train their minds, using the movement and physical rigor that comes from martial arts as a means to meditate and to tap into their reality-bending power. They seek harmony through conflict, using it to sharpen their discipline to the point where peace and balance are intrinsic. The Do has influenced aspects of culture, religion, and philosophy across Asia, and its fingerprints can be found in Hinduism, Buddhism, Shinto, Taoism, and yoga. Our archaeological division has confirmed that they helped to build both Angkor Wat and Shaolin Temple. The Akashiana believe in reincarnation. They believe that they can dive into memories of their past lives through a layer of awareness that they call the Shunyata. They believe that all Akashiana leave their imprint within the Shunyata and that through it, they can commune with their ancestors. Akashiana are usually trained in a master and apprentice relationship, usually one master training one apprentice, someone who has proven themselves to be both compassionate, a skilled warrior, and of open mind. 
They almost always channel their magic through the movement of their bodies, performing flawless martial accelerations. If you run into one Akashiana, there is almost always at least one more, and operatives are encouraged to keep this fact in mind. The next tradition is the Celestial Chorus, and they believe in a monotheistic god or force that controls the universe. Interrogated subjects have professed that the Chorus believe that the entire universe was created and is upheld by a great cosmic song set in motion by the One. Any who know the One, in whatever shape or form, are free to add their voice to the melody. The Chorus has taken on as many forms and faces as there are religions. The Aden, Mithras, Zoroaster, Jesus, Allah, the name of the One has changed many times, always different based on where that part of the song originates from. What doesn't change is faith. Faith is what drives the reality-altering powers of the chorus. The chorus is very hierarchical. It's led by the Curia, a 17-member council of chancellors, the most respected of which is granted the title of Pontifex Maximus. The globe is divided up into territories belonging to each chancellor, and the chancellors rely on agents known as exarchs to help them manage vast domains. Many exarchs assign local priests known as presbyters to manage the day-to-day. -day. Presbyters are in charge of seeking out religious worshippers who have awoken through intense religious experience. It is worth noting that this hierarchy cuts across religious boundaries, with the chorus made up of Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and more, the belief in a single cosmic force bringing them together. Religion can be a powerful tool, and many sleepers hold fanatically, even today, to their religious beliefs. This only makes the Karas stronger, with operations against them likely to rile up anger from the populace at large. Operatives are encouraged to engage the Karas using indirect means, Manipulating the general population against them is a requirement for effectively dealing with their kind, as the masses tend to take offense when the power of their religions are eroded. The Chorus is likely to be one of the last reality deviations that we have to deal with for this reason, but make no mistake, their day will come. The Sahajia are among the most misunderstood of all their traditions, and they might be the oldest tradition to sit the council. The Sahajia indulge in drugs of all kinds. They give in to their baser lusts, and they have elaborate rituals based on orgies. All around, they just love to party, which normally would get them to be okay in my book, but this also gives them a reputation for being flighty, eccentric, and unpredictable. They get looked down upon as degenerates, touchy-feely hippie types who can be way too intense, but honestly, the truth is more complex than that. The truth is that the ecstatics, as they like to call themselves, believe in a simple precept. The mind is all. Consciousness is the seat of all things, and by expanding it, one can expand reality. The more experiences an ecstatic has, the better. They believe that the mind must be altered, for by altering it, we come to know another aspect of the truth. Sex, drugs, intense feelings, and near-death experiences, these are the things that the Sahajia use to fuel their power. Inhibition must be thrown to the wind in order to touch the Lakashim, the divine pulse. The Sahajia are extremely loose and unorganized. There is really only one rule. Consent must be given before the path can be walked. The Sahajia are forbidden from engaging with unwilling partners. They often live among the sleepers, enjoying the extreme ends of their society. Some ecstatics become daredevils or adrenaline junkies. Others become actual junkies. This makes the Sahajia much harder to locate than some of the other traditions, their lifestyle making them difficult to distinguish from the masses of human detritus which we find ourselves surrounded with. However, they also tend to work alone or in very small groups, 
which means that when they are uncovered, they are usually fairly easy to deal with. Interrogated subjects have revealed that the Sahajia live by something called the Code of Ananda, a set of rules which helps to steer the ecstatics towards compassion and enlightenment. However, we have been unable to ascertain the exact wording of this code, despite our best efforts. All we know is that it is a philosophy which goes back to a man known as Shazar. Work is ongoing to catalog the full breadth of this code, but ultimately it makes little difference to your work. Operatives are simply advised to attempt to capture any Sahajia you encounter alive, and to keep your eyes peeled for intelligence when raiding their dens. The Kavadi are perhaps one of the most persecuted of the traditions. They often find themselves at odds with the celestial Karas, who have slandered and patronized the Kavadi for centuries. We have encouraged this division as much as possible, and indeed, the arguments between the Karas and the Kavadi have paralyzed the council many times over the course of history. The Kavadi believe in the spirit world. They believe that our world and this spirit world are supposed to touch and mingle. The truth is that the Kavadi are able to tap into the interdimensional space, and they make deals with rogue Jamards. The Kavadi are often called shamans, and they are most ubiquitous among the indigenous populations of the world. They call their reality-shaping power medicine, and many of them strive to bring down the barrier between our world and the interdimensional space. This makes them an extreme threat to our plans, and as such, Kavadi stand high on the target priority list for all operatives. The Kavadi have ever borne the brunt of persecution, whether it be at the hands of witch hunters purging the pagan or when fighting against the inexorable tide of colonialism. The Kavadi have been battered about for nearly 500 years, and as such, have some of the fewest members of any tradition on the New Horizon Council. However, we have seen that begin to change since Horizon fell. The Kavadi have begun to drift towards technology, and they've noticed that the digital web is itself alive with a mind and, they claim, a soul of its own. They've taken to the internet and an era of techno-shamanism has begun. This means that the Kalvadi are able to infiltrate digital systems, and operatives are advised to take this under consideration when constructing defenses for their home base. The Kalvadi have no formal organization, instead acting as solitary agents, free to wander and wonder at their leisure. However, they will often come together in conclaves to exchange information and socialize. Incidents of these conclaves have drastically increased since the creation of the World Wide Web, with the Kavadi using the digital space to conduct these meetings where it is harder for us to find them. Operatives are advised that they need to keep the digital space in mind as a potential search area when hunting down Kavadi. The Chakravanti claim to have the power of life and of death. Interrogated subjects claim to have lived before and they say they have died before, suggesting a similar belief in reincarnation to the Akashiana. The Chakravanti that we have captured have professed to believe in a great wheel, a massive cosmic turning mechanism which recycles souls through life as the basis for reincarnation. These awakened claim to understand the true balance that the universe requires to operate. Life is born, it grows and thrives, it grows old, and then it dies. This is the way of things, and the Great Wheel exists to maintain the cycle, while the Chakravanti believe that they exist to maintain the wheel. They are perhaps the most ethical of all their traditions, but this is a symptom of the terrible burden that they foist upon themselves. The Chakravanti must maintain the wheel, and sometimes that means knowing when a life must end. Interrogated subjects have revealed that the Chakravanti deal death in the name of balance. They judge the people around them and remove them if they are a net negative influence on the world. They also hunt down any deviants that they believe to have escaped the cycle, immortals such as the blood deviants. Because of this, 
They are skilled assassins and martial artists, with recordings gathered from the field showing that they are capable of combating even the famed Akashiana. Indeed, it seems the two traditions have a deep, long-standing feud that goes back to even before the founding of the Order of Reason. We have recorded many battles between the two traditions on surveillance footage. The Chakravanti serve our own interests in this regard. You may be able to strike up a temporary alliance to deal with other deviants, but this does not mean that the Chakravanti are not dangerous or that they are not to be targeted themselves. It simply means that they may prove to be a useful tool, and operatives should not discard a useful tool until it ceases its usefulness. There is no overarching organization to the Chakravanti. Instead, they are trained in a master-student relationship, much like the Akashiana. The student, known as the Chatra, swears a life oath to the teacher, known as an Akarya. The Akarya then supervises a death ritual that is known as the Diksha, in which the Chatra is purposefully killed. They die and must find their way back from the interdimensional space that we have dubbed the Shadowlands. Only then may they be apprenticed, and they will then spend years learning the healing and killing arts. Again, Chakravanti are incredible individual fighters. Operatives are encouraged to engage them only with superior numbers. The Order of Hermes is by far the largest of all the traditions. They go back into the mists of time, and the Order has gone through many incarnations. They are the most refined and most knowledgeable of all their traditions, and in the present day, they are our greatest rivals. They are the most organized tradition, and by far the most strong-willed. Worse, they view themselves as superior to other awakened, including ourselves, and in some ways, they are. The archives of the Order of Hermes are comparable to our own with no other tradition having anything even close to the ocean of knowledge that the Order has to call on. Hermetics utilize alchemy, high ritual science, and a number of other esoteric approaches to the arts. They set up elaborate ceremonies, memorize incantations and complex hand gestures. They mix regions with ingredients that only they can synthesize. Thankfully, The overcomplicated nature of their reality warping prevents them from easily deploying their power, which gives us an advantage in a direct confrontation. The Order of Hermes has a vast, steeped history, going all the way back to ancient Egypt. They've always been extremely hierarchical. The structure of the Freemasons and other similar secret societies stems loosely from that of the Order of Hermes, and indeed, we have intelligence to suggest that many of these groups act as fronts that can funnel talented individuals on the cusp of their epiphany into the Order's ranks. Interrogated subjects have revealed that once accepted into the Order, an initiate must apprentice themselves to a mater or pater. This person acts as the initiate's tutor for the years that follow, and it is their job to put their student to a crucible that is capable of breaking lesser minds. The training is absolutely unforgivable, rigorous to the extreme, and an initiate must advance through nine levels before they are finally recognized as a full member of the order. The relationship between Mater or Pater and their student is often purposefully antagonistic, with the teacher going out of their way to make life miserable for the student, the idea being that only the absolute best will be able to transcend these obstacles to rise up the levels within the order. In practice, however, this creates a highly competitive environment and a backdrop of ill will. Operatives are advised that this ill will can be used to our advantage. It is not uncommon for initiates within the Order of Hermes to cheat in order to get one over on their pater or mater, and we have exploited this fact before. The Society of Aether goes back to ancient Troy, and they follow a framework which we would recognize ourselves as almost scientific. The Kitab was one of the first attempts at a systematic natural philosophy, and it is this document that the Society of Aether has arranged itself around. 
captured copies of the Kitab vary in minor degrees, but they all take the form of a dialogue with King Priam of Troy, where the speaker attempts to advise the king on the defense of the city after it's been besieged by the Mycenaeans. The narrative seems to be an analog for the scientific method, and the society has tried to exemplify this method across its long history. Indeed, there was a time not long ago when the society was a member of our vaunted technocracy, though this is no longer the case. Despite the fact that the society reveres science, it is not the science that we know. Instead, etherites gravitate towards theories that would be considered disproven by most of our own professors. Indeed, the name itself sprang from the Aether, a scientific theory which fell out of favor at the dawn of the 20th century. The Aether, string theory, flat earth, and more. The society is home to dozens, maybe hundreds of disparate scientific ideas which we profess to be pseudoscience or outright nonsense. This does not seem to stop their reality-bending power from working, however, and the etherites are capable of producing technological marvels which can rival our own. They are a very large factor in the New Horizons Council's ability to fight back against us during the modern age. And as such, any etherites you encounter take a high priority on the target list for all operatives. As mentioned before, the society was actually born out of the technocracy, specifically the rivalry between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. The Etherites used to be a division within our organization. Nikola Tesla was a member of this division, but he butted heads constantly with Edison. Tesla constantly claimed that Edison would steal his research and ideas, though this claim has yet to be confirmed and it was likely driven by Tesla's own ego. The conflict would eventually lead Tesla to break with the technocracy, and many of his fellow etherites would follow suit, going with him to join with the Council of Nine Traditions in a revolt against us. It was a heavy blow against the technocracy at the time, though we have since recovered and are stronger than ever without their outdated theories holding us back. The society is loosely organized, usually only coming together in rare instances to exchange knowledge. They do not have a hierarchy, and instead, their order is built of many individuals, all of them going their own way, seeking their own idea of scientific truth and establishing themselves as, quote, scientists. Etherites are recruited usually when they are older. An already established etherite recognizing the spark of genius in an individual. Then, that etherite lays out an unknowing test for the initiate, a series of obstacles and problems which usually culminates in them finding and reading the Kitab, which usually result in an awakening. This process is far from a guarantee, and many initiates never reach their epiphany. Operatives are advised that this long period of training is usually able to be spotted by an increase in stress and fatigue in observed individuals, and they are further advised that interfering during this process can potentially result in swaying the etherite to our side. The Verbena are old, very old, one of the traditions that can trace their roots back to the creation of humanity alongside the Chakravanti or the Akashiana. They believe that at the beginning of time, there was the wick, some nebulous fusion of spirit, mind, and flesh. These wick, according to Capture Verbena, were like gods, and they guided humankind through their early beginnings. The first teachings of these wick were known as the old ways, and this is what the Verbena hold at their heart. They are able to command nature itself and they're known for healing and for living in the wild. They can often change their shape or commune with the animals, and they oftentimes can be categorized as stereotypical witches or druids. Interrogated subjects have revealed that their beliefs stem mainly from the idea that pain and pleasure, that feeling of the physical form, is itself the very essence of creation. They will carve runes into their skin, fast for long periods of time, or 
endure other horrendous ordeals that could kill lesser humans. Verbena from the Plains Indians, for example, are known to perform the infamous sun dance. The Verbenae philosophy is close to the philosophy of nature itself. They are cold, hard, but also quick and fierce in their passion. Many times they will avoid technology, preferring to live in the wild with the barest of essentials, but this is not always the case. Operatives are advised that while many of the Verbena do not dwell in urban areas, some do. Keep your eyes open out there. The Verbena will be organized into local cells that they call covens, usually with no more than 13 members. Each coven is centered around a grove, and each grove is centered around a world tree. Groves can be anywhere, from the backyard fire escape in a city to pocket dimensions within the umbra that can be walked into. They could even be pristine, forgotten lands, far out in the reaches of the wilderness. Operatives are advised that these world trees often contain truly phenomenal amounts of primordial essence, which can make them easily detectable should the verbena not take extreme care to hide their presence. Any sudden primordial flares that are detected along any of the predetermined ley lines or ley nexus are almost certainly verbena, as they tend to create their groves along these predetermined energy paths. Virtual adepts. The name might conjure images of computers and the digital realm, but this is actually a bit misleading. The virtual adepts can trace their origins all the way back to Sumeria, to the ancient hero known as Gilgamesh. Adepts believe that everything, the entire universe, me, you, your dog, everything is information, hard data, compressed and operating in a system that is beyond normal understanding. Interrogated subjects have revealed that to the adepts, there is a code that underlines the entire universe and that this code can be tracked to literally hack reality. In ancient times, the code took the form of words, complex languages that were beyond normal mortal knowledge. Things like the cuneiform system that was devised by Gilgamesh. But, as time wore on, the form of the code changed, updating as our understanding of language and mathematics advanced. In the modern era, the code can literally be code, an equivalent to digital commands. Indeed, most adepts will spend a large majority of their time within the digital realm where they oftentimes carve out whole sectors for themselves. Virtual adepts. They're the elusive anarchists of the internet. They come and go as they please through a world that has become more interconnected than ever before. But this is just a shadow when compared to their true power. The ability to manipulate what they claim to be the God Code that underlines all of creation. This God Code can be used to do almost anything, including sparking the spontaneous generation of life. While we have been unable to confirm the existence of this code, the adepts, well, their belief and their power is undeniable. Not only can they warp and command the digital space, they are capable of warping reality itself with their strings of numbers and letters. Operatives are advised to be wary of digital defenses. Things like motion sensors, security cameras, server farms, and more, they're all vulnerable to exploitation by the adepts without the installation of additional firewalls or other protections. Please contact your direct handler if you feel your defenses require an update. And believe me, it is better to be safe than sorry when the adepts are concerned. The virtual adepts have no formal structure or organization, instead operating as rogue individuals or very small cells that are disconnected from one another. Induction into the adepts is normally a secretive process which only unfolds when a standing adept sees potential within another. That adept will leave a string of clues behind, digital or otherwise, which the initiate must follow in order to prove themselves. This eventually will lead the initiate to strike against some kind of corporate or authoritarian pillar of society, 
they'll be pushed to correct some social injustice or play some kind of prank that involves shaming the elite. Operatives are advised to pay attention to civil strife and unrest in their area just in case it may stem from an adept at its source. You should also remain aware of the fact that while the adepts do lend themselves to the digital space, this is not completely ubiquitous. We have captured adepts who still hold to older forms of code, such as writing or artwork. But okay, that's going to bring us to the close of this report. There is so much more that we need to cover in terms of Awakened, as I'm sure many of you are aware. The structure and history of our own organization will be covered in a future report, but there are also mystical reality deviants who do not swear allegiance to the New Horizon Council. These disparate mages can be an extreme threat all of their own, but they often lack the resources that New Horizon can bring to bear. It was decided that it was far more important for you to have general information on the traditions since they will make up the bulk of aggressive encounters that you have with reality deviants. Study this report. Know the traditions like you know our own divisions. Understanding our enemy is the first step to truly containing them. But alright, that's enough out of me. Take care of yourselves out there, agents. Stay safe, keep your heads on a swivel, eyes on your dead drop for the next report. If you're still alive by then, you'll hear from me in a month. Supervisor Kazdan, signing off. <laughs>